today on Family Talk. You're listening to Family Talk, the radio broadcasting division of the James Dobson Family Institute. I am that James Dobson, and I'm so pleased that you've joined us today. You know, the Bible is full of redemption stories, whether it was of the prodigal son or the apostle Paul or the prophet Jonah. Our Heavenly Father desires reconciliation with His people. In a moment, you're going to hear about a man who experienced that life-changing power of Jesus in a profound way. His name is Stu Fuhlendorf, and he is the senior pastor of Redemption Hills Church just up the road in Littleton, Colorado. Today, my colleague, Dr. Tim Clinton, talks with Pastor Stu about his incredible testimony and what he is doing now to lead others to Christ. This is a beautiful story. Uh, There's just a lot of content to cover, so let's get started. Here's Dr. Tim Clinton to introduce our guest on this edition of Family Talk. Thanks, Dr. Dobson. I'm joined uh, in our Family Talk studios today by Pastor Stu Follendorf. He leads a church just up the road from here in Littleton, Colorado, called Redemption Hills. Pastor Stu has an incredible testimony of transformation and redemption from a difficult and some would say a rebellious lifestyle. His autobiography uh, was released earlier this year titled Wall Street to the Well, a story of transformation from fortune to faith. Pastor Stu, thanks for joining us today. I have no doubt our listeners are going to enjoy this story. Welcome to Family Talk. Thanks, Tim. Happy to be here. As we get started, Stu, uh, being here, you, you led devotions for our Family Talk team this morning. Being here, but not in this building, in this moment of time for you is really special. You uh, were called by the Lord into the ministry uh, midlife. That's a big piece, but this moment, um, I could hear in your voice today. This is something really, really special. It is. I'm. You know, it's only by God's grace that I'm here. And it could have just as easily been dead, in in many ways, or um, at least dead spiritually for sure, if not physically. And so, yeah, it's only by the grace of God that I'm here. It's only by the grace of God that um, I love who He is and want to even dive deeper and let people know who who God is. And so, yes, God has transformed me in a radical way. And I'm always grateful for, for that. But yeah, I'd be the last person you would ever think that would ever be This is there. one of those, oh, I can't. No. God did something special. Let's go back to uh, your childhood growing up. Uh, you were born here in, in the state of Colorado. Um, your, your childhood years, there's some interesting twists in it, but there's, there's some real pain in it. Stu, do you see a lot of what happened as a boy begin to set you on a path kind of uh, uh, that led to a lot of brokenness? Oh, indeed. Uh, I grew up in what I would call a seeker, a seeker home. Uh, My mom and dad were not believers. uh, And my grandparents, who I spent a lot of time with, uh, were seeking all kinds of different worldviews. They were Jehovah's Witnesses, so I was influenced by that at an early age. Uh, I remember walking around giving out watchtowers uh, around a small town in, in Colorado. And then my, my parents were divorced when I was 14. And so my mom married six more times after that. So you can imagine the kind of household that was and the brokenness. And so, yeah, it's in that, it's in, it's in that environment of both loving grandparents but seeking grandparents and um, a divorce that led me to really uh, be focused on myself and taking care of myself, and it'd be understandable. I mean, I was 14 years at the time, and um, I really set out to make my way, but by taking care of myself, because I was I was hurt during that time period. Yeah. They say that brokenness cries out for relief, mm-hmm. for healing, for hope, uh, and we often uh, reach or we search or we, we'll, we'll, we'll do anything to fill the emptiness inside of us. Stu, so you... You, you really went on a journey as a boy, growing up through your early years. It was fascinating to read your story, uh, how you turned to sports as a way to kind of fill the emptiness. You later went into um, trying to find your way in, in education, business, and more. And it led you um, down some pretty insane paths. Hmm. Uh, you 
Uh, you were really searching. Uh, it, years ago, I read a, a comment that said, the, the man knocking on the door of the harlot is really looking for God. That would be me. And so I can tell you that um, it, it was in all of those things that you just mentioned, Tim, about you know starting to become a hyper-competitive athlete and turning to being in the gym all the time or even being a student. Some people turn away from those things. I turn towards them looking for meaning. Um, looking for for places to be loved. And so, though my grandparents were very loving to me, they weren't my parents. And so I grew up on a ranch and farm. And, and even in that environment, frankly, in northeastern Colorado, in the, what you do on a ranch and farm is you take care of yourself or you don't eat. And so what I ended up doing is um, turning to me to self-sufficiency and taking care of myself and... If nobody else is going to take care of me, I'll take care of myself. Indeed. And, 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 and in addition, if the Lord isn't in my life, then what are the things that I'm going to turn to uh, to look for answers and purpose? I mean, Ecclesiastes says vanity, vanity. It's all vanity anyway. Yeah, yeah. And so I'm looking at sports. I'm looking at school during this time period, um, other kinds of relationships. Um, by the time I was in college, I started drinking some. And so I was looking for, for alcohol. Anything that is Blaise Pascal would say that was filling that empty hole in my heart, um, that vacuum-shaped hole in my heart, is what, what I was after. But it certainly wasn't the Lord God, Jesus Christ. And I can tell you, I was becoming more and more angry. You really battled with God in a lot of ways as a, as a young man, didn't you? I did. Uh, I did for a variety of reasons. And I'll, and I'll tell you, just to be honest with you, um, my parents, when they were going to church, were going to a church that was somewhat legalistic. And when they got divorced, um, my mom felt like some of the church members turned away from her. And as a young boy, as a 14-year-old, uh, I saw that. And so I thought, well, you know, now I realize as a, as a pastor that it's not it's not Jesus. It's some people who are we're all sinners at a certain level. Yeah. And so blaming the church for that was a, was irrational. But I did. And so it was from that point forward as I became a young man um, getting through school and, and all of that, that um, I just turned to myself. Yeah. There was a little girl uh, in the story. There always is. Uh, her name's Trish, who, by the way, is your beloved wife. And uh, God um, brings her into uh, those early chapters. Tell us about Trish and um, how things got going with her. And, and, and somewhere, there was something about that connection that later on really becomes really significant to you. Indeed. Trish has been incredibly important, the most important person in my life. Um, and we've been married 32 years. Uh, Trish was raised um, a marginally Catholic household. Her dad went to Notre Dame. I was raised nothing, as I've said. And so we got we, we met in a bar, which is apropos. And so we uh, she picked me up. And but searching, it, everybody's searching, everybody's searching, right? Yeah. And so, uh, you know, what ended up happening is that uh, we were married as not Christians. We were both not Christian. We were married in a Roman Catholic church, but it wouldn't have mattered to me. It could have been circus, circus, or a Buddhist temple, as far as I was concerned. And then um, we set out to make our ways. And so once I met Trish, I got interested in business. And Trish was, an, at the time, an aerospace engineer. Yeah. And uh, so um, we moved to San Diego, where she, right after being married, where she was an aerospace engineer. And I got my MBA from the University of San Diego. And from that point forward, we set out to make our way. And uh, not Christians. And so I wanted to um, get rich. In fact, I remember in the 1987, when I was in business school, I watched the movie Wall Street. Uh, which was that movie with Michael Douglas and Gordon Gekko. Oh, yeah. uh, and I remember listening to his speech about greed. This is when I was in business school, about greed is good, greed is right. It gave me goosebumps. I thought, this is this is what I want. This is for me. This is going to give me purpose. So that, that's where it is. from Colorado, we're going. We're going. We're, we're going to make it happen. We're going to make and, it happen. And, and here's the deal. You did go. You uh, took a couple companies public, IPO and uh, – and, and good things were happening, and you were, you were busting it. Tell us what begins to happen. Then. So yeah, I became a chief financial officer at a, at 29 years old of the first company, and within two years we were able to take that company public, a company called EFTC out of Colorado, and uh, and for the first time in our lives we actually had some money, so we didn't save any of it. Uh, uh, we we bought a house on the golf course. We built a big mahogany bar. But um, yeah, and so we, we moved forward to make our way. And so the company grew to about 1,400 employees from 50. And in 1998, we were named the number one public company in Colorado. 
we moved to Evergreen, bought a big a big house, 6,000 square feet, um, and yet at the same time feeling incredible um, dissatisfaction. Like as, even though I was accomplishing everything that I wanted and had set out to do, I was feeling discontent. And so that's where I, that's where I was at the time. The wheels start coming off. They do. You know, they say in mental health, one of the one of the scariest things is when the mind starts ruminating. And that's where rumination means you can't turn the switch off. And the fear is starting to take over and you're you're way out ahead of yourself. You're seeing total destruction and more. And it gets scary, especially for men. Uh with some guy not long ago get into some financial trouble and no one would have ever thought for him what he would have done. And he winds up eventually that story folds where he takes a drive and he doesn't come back. Yep. Like, you know what I'm saying? Yep. And I, I, there are a lot of people, I mean, the pace, the pain, the pressure of modern day life, there are a lot of people listening right now that they're on the edge, they're living on the edge. A lot of people are pushed. There's no margin anymore, you hear what I'm saying? Yes. And yet they want, they're driven, and things are spinning, and there are a lot of people probably listening right now who are weeping inside saying, I'm this, I know where this is going. Tell us, Stu, where did it go? Yeah. So I got hit from two sides. One was, as I was accomplishing what I wanted, there was a sense of emptiness and dissatisfaction, and I was continuing to gain in my arguing against God. I wasn't ambivalent. I was reading Christopher Hitchens and um, oh. and Bertrand Russell and those kind of things. And then that's searching. It, absolutely, and it's a faith. It's, atheism is a faith that is a very difficult faith to comprehend because because it is a faith. It takes a lot of faith to believe that it does. The second area that I got hit from was my wife became a Christian um, in nineteen in the late 90s, 1997. And so I found myself in a position where I was feeling dissatisfied even as I was making millions. And my wife had a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. And I saw this comfort and love and peace that she had that I did not have. I had a growing anger. And so I'm getting hit with a sense of why am I not feeling more significant over accomplishing what I had always set out to do, which was to get rich? And my wife is changing and becoming more loving. And seemingly the things that I thought she should be important to her were no longer very important. You're listening to Dr. James Dobson's Family Talk. I'm Dr. Tim Clinton. Our special in studio guest, Stuart Fullendorf. He's a pastor uh, up in Denver. His autobiography uh, was released earlier this year titled Wall Street to the Well, a story of transformation from fortune to faith. Again, we're excited to have you here, Pastor. You and Trish decide to get away for a date night. That didn't go all that well. Tell us about it. By 2000, I we had moved to Seattle to, for me to take on another job, like growing a company of 1,400 people and making millions doing that wasn't enough. So we moved to Seattle, and, and my wife um, was growing in the Lord, had found a great church out there, and we went out on an anniversary um, dinner to a to a restaurant called Canlis, and we she just really wanted to um, have a loving evening, and so she looked at me during the course of the evening, and she said, "Stu, I know we have some differences right now, but I love you." And I said, "Trish, I think you're a whack job. I think you're a Bible thumper and a Jesus freak." And the dinner didn't go very well after that, I, I as you can imagine. Think that would go very well. <laughs> right. And so um, that's, but I guess as, as a sign, that's where we were. This, it's not something I'm proud of at all. In fact, I've repented over this uh, when we get to that part. But um, so Trish would be reading her Bible downstairs, and she would see me come downstairs, and she would purposefully cover the, the Bible up because she knew that if I saw her reading the Bible, uh, I would get angry at her. So there were moments like that during this time period that it was very difficult. You know what, you know what encourages me, though, in, in these kind of stories is if you really see what's at work, you begin to realize God um, is shouting at you. He's trying to get your attention. He's a pursuer God. Hmm. That's, the, that's the amazing thing to me about God. We don't really pursue him. He pursues us. And the real issue is what are we going to do with that beckoning? What happened, what happened for you, Stu? Well, I think your your observation is right on the money. Later, I realized that it was actually in all of the suffering that God was pursuing. Trish kept praying for me, kept on me. Um, she, she would say, I can't find a, a verse in the Bible that would, would allow her to leave me. And she would tell people that. And then she said, I realized in that time period that um, it wasn't happiness that God wanted for me. It was holiness. Huh. 
So um, she hung in there. She just hung in there and kept praying. And she kept asking me to go to church. I wouldn't go to church. And finally, she asked me to go to her community group. I wouldn't go. And so finally, I went to church and I heard a sermon. And it was on, again, it's not, it didn't seem seeker friendly, but it was on predestination and, and about how I'm, I wasn't God and God's in charge. And, and boy, it just, it just hit me right between the eyes. And so it was about that time period, and that was 2003, that over the next two or three years, I, I literally God started to soften my heart. But I still wasn't a Christian, and I was getting ready to um, take another company with a job with another company that was going to go public. So the third company through an IPO, and that actually is where my story of salvation um, happens. Let's talk about the crash. Here's where um, everything that you were aspiring toward, everything that meant something, got stripped away. You wound up in a lawsuit with the SEC. You wind up losing all your fortune. Yeah, Tell us. Absolutely true. In 2006, I became a Christian. Uh, it was on the initial public offering road show with a company called Isilon Systems, and it was in London, England, that I, that I became a Christian. And up to that point in 2006, I was again drinking more and more, medicating myself because I couldn't, I, I was struggling with answers. Um, eating my way through life, so becoming obese. And um, it was on the road show in 2006 that through all of the questions and all the answers that God, God saved me. And a fairly dramatic um, night in, at the Savoy Hotel in London. I talk about it in my book. And so after that, um, uh, for me, life got harder. What ends up happening is um, I drink more and more after becoming a Christian. Uh, I uh, take stock options in the company that the, which had just gone public. I cash it out. I buy a wine distributorship. I get fired from my job uh, by the board of directors as my worldview changes. Uh, and the recession hits in 2008. The company, my company, struggled to survive. Ended up not surviving. And so w- the way God worked in my life, and again, you can. There's a mystery to this in terms of of uh, God's uh, my own sin and God's sovereignty, but I believe God is in all of that. That He um, shook that which is shakable. Hebrews twelve twenty five and forward. He shook with that which was shakable to leave the unshakable to remain. So He took all of my worldly idols after becoming a Christian and broke them all down and um, led me to Him. How was Trish in all this? She was much better than I was. There were periods where I would be in despair to the point of you were talking about the man driving the car. Yeah. I'd be sitting on the edge of the bed before getting sober, which I ended up drunk and her arm around me saying, the stress and pressure and all of this is going to kill you if you don't um, submit this and to God, to give this to God. And and he's in this. And so she was incredibly loving. Was she always perfect? No. Sometimes she sounds like a saint in the book. She'll tell you, which is perfect. No, but she was an amazing woman of God. Um, understanding that there was things more important than all these material possessions and career and reputation. And then, as you mentioned, I ended up in a lawsuit as well, being accused of something that I didn't do. But it's an important part of the book as well, because um, I grew in Christ through that. Let's go back to the hotel room. Okay. And this dramatic encounter with God. Hmm. What happened? So we were halfway through the initial public offering of Isilon Systems. It was becoming the hottest technology IPO in in five years in America. We were in London, England. We went out and had Indian food with the investment bankers, Morgan Stanley, so forth. After dinner, we went out, walked around Soho, Market Street, and one of the investment bankers pointed up to the window and said, see that yellow star on the window? That's where Marx wrote his Communist Manifesto for the Education Workers Union, something like that. And we all said, wow, that's interesting. And then one of the bankers joked and said, um, it's a good thing he didn't have that right. And we all jo- joked and said, that's true. And then one of the other people in the group said that he did have one thing right, and that's that Marx said that religion is the opiate of the masses. And I kind of mumbled, I'm like, yeah, remember, this is after about three years of my heart softening, going to church, asking questions. And a lot of this is in the book, I'm talking to the pastor. And so um, we went back to the Savoy Hotel where we were staying. And I, I um, didn't go to the bar, which I normally would have. And I went up to the room and sat in a lamb upholstery um, skin chair. And what hit me was, what would the world be like without Jesus Christ? Yeah, the world's broken. Yeah, the world's fallen. Um, yeah, there are issues. But what would the world be like without Jesus Christ? And it's in those questions that I felt the wave of the Holy Spirit over overcome me. And tears came to my eyes, and I had a very Lutherian moment where I, I said, Lord, I've had this all wrong. Um, I'm 43 years old, and I've rebelled against you. I've argued against you. 
yeah, the world's broken, but Jesus, I want you to be my Lord and Savior. And so I literally laid on the floor and repented in the Savoy Hotel in London and said, take me, take me. I just said it over, take me. And I cried all night. It wasn't like a 10 minute thing. I cried all night and I cried because I felt a sense of joy because I was starting to understand or I did now understand what Trish had experienced. But I also had a sense of regret that I was 43 and I had influenced so many people in so many ways and I yet, had yet to really feel a sense of grace and mercy in that. And so I cried all night long and um, the Lord brought me to him on December 7th, 2006. Stu, there are people listening that may be on a personal journey or they're thinking right now about someone they love and they're, they're crying out. They're probably, they, they might be crying out to God right in this very moment. What would you say to them? What do you, what do you tell them in that moment right now about who God is and what they need to do? Hmm. Prayer is important. If you, if you know of somebody um, who, who is rebelling against the Lord, prayer, 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 unceasingly pray for that, for that person as my wife did for me. Um, act out in love uh, in all things. We love because God loved us first. And so all we can do is love and pray and be the example for people, knowing that it's the Lord who saves, it's the Holy Spirit who moves in. Um, do your best to, to um, dictate and advocate for the Lord and bring the Lord in front of them, but ultimately it's the call of God to do that. Mm-hmm. And so we don't have the pressure that necessarily that we think we have because God, God is the one that saves. And so I'm so thankful for that. Additionally, just know that um, God is perfect, God is loving, God will always do the right thing, knowing that they may not be saved today, they may not be saved tomorrow, but we were faithful that at some point God will do his work and save if we as Christians pray and are with them and care for them. Turn your heart toward him. Amen. Yeah, reach back home. Get back there. Amen. Stu, God called you into the ministry. You wind up going to Denver Seminary, get your Master of Divinity degree. You have a ministry up there called Redemption Hills Church. Um, what are you trying to do with your people? What do you want them to know? When they, when they, when they encounter you, when they, when they come to church, when they leave, and they're fighting it, everybody's, yeah. everybody's fighting it. What do you want them to know? I, I just want them to have a deeper um, understanding of who God is and all their tribulations and joys and struggles. I want them to know that every day that as their pastor, that the kingdom is where they are, that if they're CEOs, if they're taxi drivers, if they're accountants, whatever, if they're landscapers, that the more they understand who God is and learn who God is and pour into their whatever their occupation or life is, their family life, their community, that there's where the kingdom is. And so, boy, there's no culture that needs it more than than our culture to know that Jesus Christ is not just Sunday. Jesus Christ is 24-7 wherever, wherever we are. And that's what I want them to know. And uh, if they know that and if they know, know God better than and then I'll die happy tomorrow. God, raise up a generation of pastors like that who believe that. Pastor Stu, thanks for joining us today. His autobiography uh, was released earlier this year titled Wall Street to the Well, a story of transformation from fortune to faith. This, this book uh, is really a gift, especially to those who are on a journey right now. And when they encounter these pages, what's the takeaway? takeaway is um, that Christ is sufficient in all matters in life, that no matter where you are, what you've done, how much you've sinned, there is no sin too great. If the Apostle Paul was a murderer of Christians and became the great apostle, or David was an adulterer and was a man after God's heart, it doesn't matter where you are in life. If you know that Christ is sufficient and you're not, then your life will be transformed. That's why we come to you every day on this station, because we want you to know how much God loves you, cares for you. And by the way, how much he wants to work through you to influence your world around you. Thanks for listening. Pastor Stu, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Tim. I appreciate it. I'm Roger Marsh, and you have been listening to Dr. James Dobson's Family Talk. Dr. Tim Clinton has been our host on today's program, and his guest, Pastor Stu Fuhlendorf. If you were encouraged by Stu's story... 
You can learn more by going to today's broadcast page at drjamesdobson.org. There you'll see a link for his autobiography, Wall Street to the Well, as well as information about his church. You'll find all that and more when you go to drjamesdobson.org and then click onto the broadcast page. Well, that's all the time we have for this week. Join us again Monday for another exciting and insightful edition of Dr. James Dobson's Family Talk. I'm Roger Marsh. Thanks for listening and have a great weekend. This has been a presentation of the Dr. James Dobson Family Institute. This is James Dobson again. As we close today's program, I just want to thank so many of you out there who make this broadcast possible with your contributions. And I want to tell you how much your generosity is appreciated.